Good morning. So it is our great honor and pleasure to welcome uh, Eric Betzich today, uh, who will give us a, a conference, which uh, will both be uh, the monthly of colloquium uh, of the physics department and the, con the scientific conference in physics, traditionally uh, given to first-year students uh, at Cole Polytechnic. So thank you all, all for being here, and uh, also thanks, of course, for Eric, to Eric for uh, accepting our, our invitation to give this talk. Uh, so, um, Eric Betzig uh, started uh, as a PhD student in Cornell and then moved to Bell Labs. And during this uh, first period of, of his career, he worked on, uh, he made major contribution to near field uh, optical microscopy, which is one of the methods for breaking the diffraction limit in microscopy. And then, after quite some years away from science, he made a remarkable comeback by inventing a photo activated laser microscopy. Uh, which is uh, another method for uh, breaking the diffraction limit, which can be used uh, in living cells. So this discovery uh, uh, was awarded together with other diffraction limited mi uh, microscopy methods using fluorescent molecules, was awarded the 2014 Nobel Prize. So Eric was awarded together with uh, Stefan Hell and W.E. Murner. And uh, so uh, now Eric is working at uh, Janelier Research Campus and I think will show us uh, that the dream of uh, imaging biological systems, living biological systems at small, uh, special, and temporal scales is, is well alive. So, please, Eric. Well, thank you, Manuel, and thanks for the opportunity to be here today on a beautiful day in June. So, um, much of my career has been devoted to the problem that if this is the size of a protein molecule, then when you look at it in a regular optical microscope, it makes that big fuzzy ball that's about 100 times larger. So on the one hand, this is really bad news, because if we want to understand how little inanimate molecules come together to make this thing called a cell that can move and eat and reproduce, it's too coarse by about a factor of 100. But on the other hand, it's also good news because that fuzzy blob is about 100 times smaller than the size of the cell itself. So ever since Hooke and Van Leeuwenhoek in the 17th century, people have been able to learn a heck of a lot of cell biology by using a regular optical microscope. So in the first half of my talk, I'm going to tell you about the work we've done to get around that limit of resolution. In the second half, I'm going to turn around and say, hey, wait a minute. There's still a lot that we as physicists can do to improve microscopes even at the diffraction limit. So I got my start in this field back in 82 when I went to grad school. And I don't know about those of you who want to have a scientific career, but when I went into science, I did it because I always wanted to do something big. I didn't want to do incremental work. And when I went there, I met my eventual thesis advisors, Mike Isaacson and Aaron Lewis. And Mike was an electron microscopist who used his microscope to drill holes much smaller than the wavelength of light in an opaque screen. And he and Aaron figured that if you shined light on one side of that screen, then the light that came out on the other side would be initially collimated to the size of the hole rather than the much bigger wavelength. So then you would have this little nano-sized flashlight that you could drive around point by point and get an image. The goal was to basically make an optical microscope that can look at living cells with an electron microscope. And like I said, I always wanted to do what I thought would be breakthrough science and not incremental science. And so of all of the things that I could chose at Cornell, this seemed to me to have the most potential legs to it. And so that's what I gravitated to. So I worked on that technology first for six years at, 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 uh, in grad school, got it to the point where we sort of had proof of principle data, um, was able to use that to, to wiggle my way into the door of Bell Labs and then had my own lab to start to continue to develop this technology. Um, within a few years, we got to the point where it could be used fairly routinely. So we were able to do super resolution photolithography like is used to create integrated circuits. At one time, we had the world record for data storage density when we could write bits of information as small as 60 nanometers. We demonstrated absorption, refractive index, and polarization contrast. And in 1993, we were the first, actually, to do super-resolution fluorescence imaging of cells. Fluorescence is probably the most important contrast mechanism 
for biologists because you can add dye molecules that specifically bind to only one or several different types of proteins in the cell to see what's going on. In this case, we were able to look at the protein actin, which forms the cytoskeleton inside of the cell. So the two other experiments that turned out to be most influential for my career later on were in 89, W.E. Morner, who shared the prize with me, by doing some experiments near absolute zero, was able to see the spectral signature of single molecules, which had been sort of a holy grail for chemistry for years. And so there was sort of a race on then to try to see single molecules at room temperature. One of the major challenges isn't so much how much signal comes from a molecule, but how much background there is from everything else. But because near field can constrain that light to a subwavelength dimension, the signal noise is really great and it becomes easy to see single molecules. So we were the first to see that. And furthermore, by using polarized light, we're able to determine the orientations of the molecules and by knowing, having knowledge of what we expect for the shape of the spot that we see in our microscope, we could use that theory to determine the positions of the molecules down to about 1 40th of the wavelength of light. In another experiment um, the following year, I worked with my best friend at Bell, Harold Hess. So Harold was working on a hot field at that time called scanning tunneling microscopy, where there'd be this sharp probe that would scan across the surface and get atomic resolution. And he was using this, again, at 2 degrees Kelvin to look at um, the energy uh, spectroscopy of superconductors. But one day, we took his STM probe out of his microscope, put in my near-field probe, and started looking at optical spectroscopy of quantum wells, these sort of sandwiches of semiconductor materials that give rise to like the light that comes out of this laser pointer here. And what we discovered is that the light in these sandwiches doesn't occur anywhere, but is confined to come out in certain discrete spots. These were due to points where there was interfacial roughness in the quantum well, so they had to kind of get trapped in these little potholes, these exciton uh, um, electron hole pairs. And when they collapse and emit light, they would only emit light in those different spots, but the color of the light would be based on the local thickness of the quantum well there. So what was important for later on is that these things, these points of emission were quite dense. So even under a near-field probe, there might be you know, 10 or 20 of such spots. And normally, those won't be resolvable. But because the line widths were so narrow at 2 Kelvin, they all glowed in sufficiently distinct colors that we could isolate them in a space of x, y, and wavelength. And so then we could then look at them one at a time. So this takes us up to 94. By this time, I had been doing this near-field technique for a dozen years, and I was really, really sick of it. And there were a number of reasons for that. The first is that it has a lot of fundamental limitations, but the most important one is the light that comes out of that aperture spreads really fast. So even if you're only about 10 molecules away from your sample, you get a major loss of resolution. And so since a cell is a heck of a lot rougher than that, it was clear that this was not going to be the path to glory to being able to do live imaging of cells, which is what I really wanted to do in the end. But there were many other problems, too. So, you know, Bell was like the preeminent research institution, um, industrial research lab in the country when I went there. Had 50 years of history to it, transistor, development of the laser, all of these things. And when you go there as a young guy like I did, you feel like you don't measure up, like you don't belong, and you feel like you're on probation. And so you feel the only way to get around that feeling is to work your ass off. So my buddy Harold, who started a couple years before I did, felt the same way. And so we always, we, we were best friends, but we were always very competitive with one another. And so Harold and I would always make sure we were number one and number two in the parking lot. And we would come in at 4.30 in the morning, and if he had beaten me, I would put my hand on the hood of his car and try to figure out how many seconds he had beaten me by, by the temperature that's, that's left over from his engine. And he, he confessed he did the same thing. So um, we would work all day, work until 11 o'clock at night, and repeat, repeat. So it was, it, was, it was a great fun, but also one of the hardest working times in my life. But, um, and that was fine, I, di I didn't mind that, and we were both very successful with what we did, but another problem is, is that in 1984, four years before I joined, 
the government broke up the phone monopoly that was sort of the financial underpinnings of Bell Labs. And so by 94, we could kind of feel the walls closing in, and it was clear they wouldn't be able to support basic research like they did. So you take how hard we worked, you take my frustration of the limitations in your field. Oh, and one final factor is that um, when I got into near field, I got into it because I thought it had a lot of potential, but also because it was a field where very, very few other people were. Maybe two other groups in the world were working in this direction. And I really like that. I do not like the idea of working in a field where there are many people. However, by 94, because of the successes we were having, near field became a very hot fad in the same way Science goes through many such fads, whether it's graphene or topological insulators or charge density waves, and, and every field in science does this. And so you get these sort of boom-bust phases like this, and, and near field was in that boom phase, and what I find is, is that as more people jump into the field who don't have experience in that field, the signal of the field stays about the same, but the noise goes to infinity, and so the SNR goes to zero. And so people start saying it can cure cancer or do whatever, and, and you know that this is all crap. And it, I felt like every good paper we did provided the justification for 100 pieces of crap that would follow. And then it was basically everything I had done was a waste of time and taxpayers' money. And so with that attitude, plus being worn out from the work, plus seeing the walls closing in at Bell, it turned Harold and I, who looked like this in 89, five years later we looked like that. So, so basically, this was reason enough all by itself to quit, so I just quit. And I quit everything. I quit not just Bell, I quit science. Um, I was sick of the whole enterprise. And so um, I didn't know what to do, so I basically became a house husband. And so one day, a few months later, I was pushing my daughter around in a stroller, and it hit me that, that you could combine that single molecule experiment with the quantum well experiment Harold and I did, to come up with a different way of beating the diffraction limit. So if your interest is to see fluorescence, then ultimately you're looking at discrete molecules decorating your sample. And the problem is, is that those guys create these fuzzy blobs that all run together. Well, if those fuzzy blobs differed from one another optically in some way, the obvious example is if they glowed in different colors, then just as in that quantum well experiment, we could isolate them in that higher dimensional space. But once they're isolated, because we know the shape of the fuzzy blob that the microscope's supposed to make, we can do a fit of that and then find the center of the fuzzy blob to much better precision than its diameter, and hence plot the coordinates of every molecule in the sample and get potentially a molecular resolution image. So I was really proud of this idea at first, and then it hit me what the catch is is that in a normal biological sample is there might be hundreds or thousands of molecules in one tightly focused spot of light. And so you need ridiculously good discrimination in that third axis to be able to see one and the mix of thousands of others that are also getting excited. And so I didn't have a good way of doing that, so that coupled with still my, my, uh, uh, my uh, disgust with science I just published the paper and left it at that. So in the end, I, I fell back on my backup plan, which was to work for my father, who had started a machine tool company um, when he was 60. And 10 years later, it had like 250 employees and 60 million in sales. And so it was growing very rapidly. He could support a leech like me to come there and, and try to do something different. And so um, in his business, they would make these very large machine tools that were customized to make exactly one part for a car, be it an intake manifold or a brake caliper or whatever. And so be, these machines would be half the size of the auditorium. And so what I did is I used these old hydraulic principles with energy storage principles like are used in hybrid cars and nonlinear control algorithms and make a machine that would be as productive but about the size of a compact car. And so um, it would move four tons at eight Gs of acceleration and position it to five micron precision. I was really as proud of this as I ever was of near field. I spent four years developing it, three years selling it. In the end, I sold two of them. And so what I learned is that while I'm certainly not an academic scientist, 
I'm a far, far worse businessman. And so um, after burning through about a million bucks of my dad's money, I went to him and I apologized and I said, I'm sorry, but I've done everything I can to try to make this thing succeed and I just can't do it. And so I quit again. And so this is now 2002, which was the blackest year of my life because not only had I pissed away my academic career, I had also blown up my backup plan of following in my dad's footsteps. So I really didn't have any idea of what to do. But I did one thing that was smart, is that I reconnected with Harold. So as Bell continued to contract, Harold left Bell in 97, went to work for a company that does test equipment for <clears throat> disk drives out in San Diego. And their company was doing OK. Um, but he and I were basically both having our midlife crises at the same time. So, um, so what we decided is, is that, you know, we, we really are not academic scientists. We would never be comfortable in a university. But at the same time, we really missed the, being able to do curiosity-driven science and working with our hands in the lab, because we're basically engineers at heart. We wanted to find a way of recapitulating or the environment that we had at Bell where we could work with our own hands and do our own research. And so we started meeting halfway or wherever in between San Diego and Michigan at different national parks to talk things over and figure out what we were going to do next. And ultimately, um, uh, I was able to convince him to quit his job as I had quit from my dad, so now we're both unemployed. So once, once I made that realization that I wanted to get back into science, I knew I had to have some kind of plan to do that. So I started reading the scientific literature, which I hadn't done for nearly 10 years. And one of the first things that struck me in the face was green fluorescent protein. So the idea that you could snip out some DNA from a glowing jellyfish and splice that next to the DNA for any protein you want, have an, any organism you want, now express that protein, and then have it glow green inside of that living organism was magic to me. I think my jaw was hanging on the ground for a week when I learned about this. Because when we did that actin experiment I showed earlier, the ability to get the dye in there to see that with high enough specificity was extremely challenging. And here it happens for free. The cell does all the work. And it can do it in live cells. And it was magic. Um, my timing couldn't have been worse because GFP came out months after I had left science. So I was in some ways probably the last man on earth to learn about GFP. And I knew when I wanted to get back in science only two things. I didn't want to do machine tools, and I didn't want to do microscopes. But when I heard about GFP, I said, shit, I got to do microscopy again. So that's what I started to do. So I started th trying to think about an idea, and I came up with one which was basically you know, in, in the atomic molecular optical field, they use these optical lattices to trap atoms in these little potentials. And I came up with a theory of new classes of optical lattices that I could decouple the periodicity of the lattice from the wavelength of light and have these multiple beams would come from different directions to create an interference pattern that would create a 3D multifocal field for doing very fast live cell imaging. I called that optical lattice microscopy. And so I tried to then see if I could sell this to any place where I could then actually demonstrate it in a lab. Of course, the first person I tried to sell on it was Harold. And while Harold didn't necessarily want to do it with me, he liked the idea, but Harold's a proud guy and he wants his own idea. He said, if I did this, I'd be, he'd be chewing my cud. And he didn't want to do that. So, um, but he was willing to help me find a way to do it. So. Um, we had a buddy from Bell who ran the National Magnetic Field Lab in this time, and uh, he had been trying to recruit Harold to come there. Um, and Harold went and met this guy, Mike Davidson, and said, I should talk to him. So Harold and I went there together, and Mike is an interesting case. He was a staff scientist at the Magnet Lab who would use polarized light microscopy to look at the grain boundaries inside the, the wires, the materials used to make these very high magnetic field um, uh, magnets. And one day he put a cocktail mix, like a margarita mix, underneath the polarized light microscope. Saw all these pretty little crystals in different colors. Took a picture of that, printed it on a, on a necktie, 
did that with other types of cocktail mixes, started selling those and made millions of dollars doing it. So after that, they pretty much let him do whatever he damn well pleased at the Magnet Lab. And what pleased him was basically to do live cell imaging. So in that era, now in the 2000s, live cell imaging was virtually synonymous with fluorescent proteins. So Mike hired basically an army of undergraduates, usually the guys who were in danger of flunking out, and made basically molecular biologists and cloners out of them, and had sort of an army of these cheap guys to make one of the world's largest libraries of fluorescent protein fusions. And so um, on that trip, we learned from Mike that there was a new type of fluorescent protein. Normally with these proteins, for example, you shine blue light on them and then they glow green. But with this new type, if you shine blue light on it, nothing happens. But if you shine a little bit of purple light on it first, you activate these proteins, and then you can shine blue light on them and glow green. So the first one of these is photoactivated GFP, um, developed by Jennifer Lippincott Schwartz and George Patterson. So Harold and I were sitting in the airport in Tallahassee, and it struck us that this was the missing link to make that idea I had pitched during my first round of unemployment after Bell to work. So the idea is very simple, is you just turn down the violet light so low that only a couple molecules come on at a time. And then they're statistically likely to be separated by more than the diameter of the fuzzy balls. You can then find their centers. Those guys either bleach or turn off. You turn on another subset with another pulse of violet light, and you go again and again and again, and you start to build up this higher resolution image. So it's the idea I had in 95, but now using time as that discriminating axis. Well, Harold and I were both really taken with this idea, and we were very excited about it, but we were scared shitless at the same time because we realized that this idea was incredibly simple. Why hasn't anybody already done this? You know, so we were worried, and we were right to be worried because there were a number of groups that were going to stumble on it right after us. So we knew that we had to work fast in order to do this. The problem is, is that we were unemployed. So um, it would take too long to get VC funding, too long to write a grant. But the good news is that when I left Bell, I told them, fuck you. When Harold left Bell, he was able to take all of his equipment with him. So we were able to take all of that out of the storage shed. And then um, Normally, you would do this kind of thing inside of a garage, but because Harold wasn't married, we could do it in his living room. And so it was a lot more comfortable there. And within a couple months, we had the scope built, but we still had a problem in that we know nothing about biology. So um, in the course of trying to pitch my optical lattice microscope, I had an invitation to give a talk at NIH at this time. And so I went and I gave that talk, and I begged to meet George and Jennifer, who had developed those, the PAGFP, and I took them to lunch, swore them to secrecy, told them the idea, and Jennifer said, fantastic, you know. I didn't know at the time that Jennifer's normal response to anything is fantastic, but, but Harold and I took that as a yes, and so we packed up the instrument, took it to Jennifer's lab, and a month later, we were taking slices through a cell. Um, this is looking at two lysosomes, little round bodies in the cell turning on the violet light so low you can see the single molecules turn on. If you sum all of the fuzzy blobs, you get something like the normal diffraction limited image. But if instead you find the centers of the fuzzy balls, you start to build up something else. And after 20,000 frames of doing that, you go from a diffraction limited image like this to the photoactivated localization microscope or palm image here, and then you can zoom in and see that. So with high enough density labeling of the, of the proteins, you can take this to about 10 to 20 nanometer resolution versus 200 for the diffraction limit. And it's a very simple technique. So, um, so shortly there, or in the same year of the, of the palm thing, in fact, in the same month, between April and May of 2005, not only did palm fall in our laps, but also our way back into science fell in our laps because of various other Bell Labs connections, I got hooked up with something I had never heard of before called the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. But it turns out to be the second biggest biomedical philanthropy in the US. And so we got hooked up. They were starting a new research facility which where imaging was going to be one of the main foci. And so immediately we got snapped up there. And we went immediately from rags to riches. 
So we both started to focus on Palm and my group more on applications and Harold to develop the ultimate 3D Palm microscope based on measuring the interference and the phase of each molecule with itself through two opposed objectives. And so in my group from 2006 to 2008, we lived and breathed Palm. So we did a number of applications. We were able with Jan Lippard's group at Berkeley to show that the size and positions of chemotaxis clusters in bacteria could be completely predicted by a stochastic model of self-assembly where the proteins insert randomly, diffuse around, and then stick with a probability existing proportional to the existing size of the clusters. We were also able to develop a multicolor capability and show that a lot of proteins that look co-localized at the diffraction limit actually aren't, in this case, focal adhesion proteins, which are the points of contact of the cell to the extracellular matrix, showing they form these little nano-aggregates that are spatially segregated. With Bob Tejan's group at Berkeley, we were able to show that one mechanism for turning off gene expression is that there's a class of genes that will hug up against the red nuclear membrane, and then there's an exclusion zone where these uh, core promoters that are necessary for transcription cannot make it there, and so that silences those genes. And with Tom Blanpete's group at University of Maryland, we were able to look at cultured hippocampal neurons and able to show that actin, which forms, the, of course, the, the skeleton again, and give the shape to these dendritic spines, isn't polymerized randomly, but only in certain discrete spots. And so by 2008, I was as thoroughly sick of Palm as I was of near field back in 94, and for all of the same reasons. Again, the signal stayed about the same. Super resolution became a hot fad. The noise went to infinity. The SNR went to zero. Super resolution has lots and lots of limitations, and I'll get into that in a minute. Um, and so I was disgusted with it and, and basically left it in 2008. But in 2014, it came back to haunt me in the form of a Nobel Prize. So, so basically, I have to talk Palm again, and so uh, I'm talking Palm. But I'll talk other stuff, too. So the Nobel Prize is fine. I still don't know how to intellectually process it. I mean, the week in Stockholm was, was fun, but it's, it doesn't, still doesn't feel real. And I really don't like to focus on it much because I've always wanted to think about what's next, not what's in the past. And this is about something I had done in the past as opposed to where I want to go in the future. So, um, so what are the problems with super resolution? Um, the first and, and most vexing problem for everybody, and this is true of any form of super resolution fluorescence, is that ultimately you're just looking at fluorescent molecules. And if those fluorescent molecules don't label your sample densely enough, like this sine wave here, if I only have molecules every half period, I can miss the sine wave altogether. If I have lots, it becomes good. So this is just what's called the Nyquist criterion. If I want a resolution of x, I have to sample a minimum of every x over 2. It turns out when you run the just back envelope numbers that it requires densities of labeling that are far higher than biologists have been accustomed to producing in fluorescence microscopy. So that means that almost all of super resolution, the onus is really on the biologist to find ways of producing that amount of label as opposed to on the tool developers. And so it's really slowed down the adoption of these of the correct adoption of these techniques. Um, and that Nyquist criterion is really only a necessary but not sufficient condition to have a good image. Because in the end, what you're seeing is localization events of single molecules. And those appear stochastically. So we've, if you were just at Nyquist, effectively, there's enough stochastic variability that the density of localization events is not a good indicator of the underlying molecular density distribution in the sample. You really have to go almost an order of magnitude above that to get to that level. And then you're really talking levels of, of expression of the proteins that are extremely high. And so the challenges are that oftentimes, if you want to use these techniques, you're, you're, you're kind of pushed into overexpressing the proteins in the cell. And then that, just as if you overexpress anything or you drink too much water, you do whatever, you're going to get sick. And this is what happens to biologi biological samples if they have too much of any particular protein. And so it changes the physiology, changes the structure. 
Likewise, because you have a little protein that's your glowing handle on it, that can cause misfolding or, or misaggregation or misassembly of the structures just because that bowling ball that you got attached onto the other native protein. The other fork in the road is to use exogenous dyes that you bring in after you fix the cell and try to attach those. But despite years of work, there's still lots of problems getting them to attach specifically enough to the thing that you want to label. Here you can see how patchy this labeling is on these microtubules without creating a crap load of nonspecific background. And since you're only, no, only you're seeing is fluorescence and you're inferring wherever the fluorescence is is where the feature that you care about is, this becomes a big problem. So more generally, you can ask, why do you want to do super resolution fluorescence? Well, the first is that unlike an electron microscope, which gets global contrast, fluorescence allows you to get protein-specific contrast. So you could say, OK, I'll use it as a structural tool. So then I can fix the cell. But the problem is, is that when you fix the cell with chemical fixatives, you change the ultrastructure in that process because you're aggregating proteins by definition. And so you have to always ask yourself, in the image you get, does this image really reflect the way the structure is in the cell when it's actually alive? And in many cases, the answer is probably no. But 95% of what we learned by super resolution so far is by doing exactly this. So the other fork in the road, and I think the one that really interested the Nobel Committee the most, is the ability to do live cell imaging beyond the diffraction limit. But it turns out that this is exceptionally hard. Um, the first problem is, is, you can just imagine, even if I wanted something as modest as a factor of two resolution gain in each of three dimensions, it means my little voxels in my image have one-eighth as many molecules. So in order to get the same amount of photons out, I either have to bang those molecules eight times harder, which the cell isn't going to like, or I'm going to have to wait eight times longer for the light to come out, and the cell is going to move during that time and smear out my image. And so um, it's very difficult to be able to increase resolution in a live cell context. Based on the claims in the literature, people have been asking for anywhere from 1,000 to 10,000 as many photons out of the cell as in a diffraction-limited experiment. Well, if any of you do any kind of live cell fluorescence imaging, you'll know that you'll be damn lucky to get 100 images of your cell before it's either dead or totally photobleached. So this becomes almost like a pipe dream here at these levels. Another problem is, is that, so the third part of the Nobel Prize went to Stefan Hell, who developed a very elegant solution to the diffraction problem where you excite molecules with a pulse in a diffraction-limited spot, then you bring a second beam that has a, like a donut with a zero of intensity at the center. This brings down all of the molecules back to the ground state by stimulated emission to leave a little puddle in the center, which is now the ones that will give you your signal. And then you scan that around point by point. It's very elegant, but it also requires ridiculously high powers in order to work, anywhere from 10 kilowatts to a gigawatt per square centimeter. We're seeing single molecules requires generally at least a kilowatt per square centimeter. Well, the sunlight outside today at best is probably about a tenth of a watt per square centimeter. So that's what life evolved under. And we're asking by these techniques to shine light on living things that's 10,000 to 10 billion times more intense than what they're used to. And there are very little metrics in the literature yet about what the hell this does to the cell, even assuming the cell is still alive when you're doing your, your dynamic studies on it. Um, and so in my opinion, this is part of that noise that I talked about in the field, where people claim all sorts of things, but there has been nowhere the kind of controls and metrics necessary to understand whether these claims are, really have any biological utility to them in the end. And finally, these methods are very, very slow. If you have a tiny little spot, you have to scan many, 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 many points. If you're doing serial activation of molecules, you have many, many images to bleed them all out. And it takes a long time. And by that time, your cell has moved many, many fold larger than the resolution element, and so you smear out the resolution. So in my opinion, the Nobel Prize for this field was really premature is that I think this field is still feeling its way around, 
still has many things to sort out, many things to figure out about what works, what doesn't, and find the real hits in the application space. There's certainly plenty of biology that's happening right now from super resolution, but compared to the impact that, say, EM has had or, or two photon microscopy or other things, it's still fairly minor. But in the same year that, um, um, that, that, uh, that Stefan published his initial results with STED, Mats Gustafsson published his initial results with yet another method called structured illumination. So in this technique, instead of illuminating the sample uniformly, you bring a standing wave of light to create a grating type of illumination pattern. Well, this beats against the frequencies of information inside of the sample to create low frequency patterns that are resolvable in the microscope. It's similar to if you have two screen doors that are against each other and you look through it and you see these sort of wavy moray fringes that occur there that are resolvable whereas you might not be able to see the pattern of the elements in the screen itself. So the, the reason the Nobel Committee gave for not considering SIM in that prize is that because that um, the, the, the standing wave is limited by the diffraction limit as well, the resolution gain of SIM is limited to a factor of two, whereas the other methods are diffraction unlimited. But in my opinion, that weakness of SIM is actually its strength, because with only a factor of two, that means you're much more in the ballpark of the labeling technologies that exist to this day, but furthermore, it requires far lower intensities of light and is far, far faster than the other methods. So if live imaging is what you care about, SIM is really the method of choice. So the guy who understood all of this before any of us was Motz. So Motz was developing this technique first at UCSF, and then in 2008, we're fortunate enough to recruit him to Genelia. But in 2009, he was diagnosed with a brain tumor, and he died in 2011. And so basically, I inherited much of his hardware and his people. And so I view Mots as sort of the, the, the messiah of Sim, and I am his acolyte. And so while I still very firmly believe in localization microscopy as a go-to tool to see protein-specific contrast in the sub-50 nanometer regime, in that 100 nanometer regime, there is nothing to beat SIM. And this is obvious when you start looking at live cells. So this is an example of looking at the endoplasmic reticulum, which is an organelle inside of the cell where basically proteins are sorted and finished processing before they're, before they're excreted into other parts of the cell. And looking at a single still image is fine, but even at 100 nanometer resolution, you can see the wealth of information you have by having the ability to look at sub-second frame rates for you know, almost 2,000 time points. You really get a sense of exactly how dynamic the cell is, how crazy the cell is, that you would never be able to appreciate from the other methods. Here's another example where you're looking at a T cell, the type of cell that will ultimately fight infection inside of your body that's plopped down against an antigen-presenting cover slip. And so that provokes what's known as the immunological synapse. And this is now looking at that actin cytoskeletal protein again, but again, now in a live context, so you can follow this inward flow of actin um, inside of that synapse. So if the knock against SIM, and the reason it didn't share the prize was that it's limited to 100 nanometer resolution, the focus of my group since Mats's passing was to see how we can get around that limitation. And so the easy thing to do is, that, um, is to just increase the numerical aperture of the lens, still be 2x, but at least by higher NA going further. Well, Olympus introduced on the market a couple of years ago an objective for total internal reflection imaging, where you just look at the bottom of the cell, at 1.7 NA. Well, with that, you can push the resolution down about 80 nanometers, and that's good enough to see a lot of things live. So here's an example where we're looking at clathrin-mediated endocytosis. So the plasma membrane of a cell is a barrier to try to keep the stuff you want to have in in and the stuff you want to keep out out. But eventually, you want to have things from the outside come in, and so there are cargos that have to pass through that barrier. And what happens is that 
They land on the plasma membrane, and this little invagination happens, formed by a protein called clathrin that comes around and makes that basket that you see there. And then it creates a little bulb that then pinches off and goes inside. But um, in this turf mechanism that I described, we only illuminate this top part here. But now, at the diffraction limit, they look like just blobs. But with the SIM resolution, we can see that basket is a ring. So now we can actually measure the diameters of these clathrin coated pits as they develop over time. And also, because the SIM is non-invasive enough, we can study for a long enough period of time to follow the entire evolution of clathrin-mediated endocytosis from the initial aggregation of a little pool of clathrin through the whole mature pit through its final pinching off and internalization. And then measure the sizes, measure the lifetimes, and correlate the two. So um, in this field, there's quite a bit of controversy about the role of this protein I mentioned, the cytoskeletal protein actin, and its role in aiding these things pinching off and internalizing. So we studied that. And one of the other advantages of SIM is with STED and PALM, you are always forced to use these uh, special photoswitching molecules. But with SIM, you can use any off-the-shelf molecule, and so it's easy to do multicolor imaging. So here, what we've been able to show is that actin does have a role, but only about half the time is it recruited. And even then, it has a significant, statistically significant but small effect on the shortening the lifetime. There are also these things that you saw in the fraction-limited images that look like big blobs of clathrin. We're able to resolve those as nothing more as aggregates of pits. And then finally, we also saw rings of actin, not clathrin, that were just about the same size. And we assumed that these would be co-localized with the clathrin as a mechanism to help pull in the pit. But it turned out none of them are. And so they're very common, but they're very poorly described in the EM literature. And so we really don't know what their role is. So that, so that high NA SIM takes us to 80 nanometers. But what if we need to go further? Well, this is something that Motz was working on when he died. And so the idea is to use the same sort of satur de saturated depletion principle that is the basis of Stefan Stead and more recently his resolve technique. So the idea is, is that you photoactivate all of the molecules in your sample so they're now in an active and, glow and potentially glowing state. But then you bring in a standing wave of depletion light, which then deactivates all of the molecules except at the nodes of this depletion beam. And then, but now it's a parallel thing because it's a grating. And then you have these little spikes of residual fluorescent molecules. Those have high spatial frequency content that allow you to extend the SIM technique beyond two times the resolution of three, four, five, what have you. So here's an example of using this to get to sort of 50 nanometer resolution by Motz's uh, graduate student, Hesper. The problem is, is this was very slow and took a lot of energy. So it was 900 seconds to get one image. So it really wasn't live cell compatible. So I hired a postdoc, Dong Li, to try to see if we could speed this up. And so we tried to think about means to do it. And as we thought about it, we realized that the saturated depletion principle that is the basis of STED and resolved and, and this form of nonlinear SIM is a really bad way to do live cell imaging. Because most of the molecules you're bringing to the activated state, you're immediately putting them back to the deactivated state and not using any of the information that comes out of those molecules as you do that. Every time you go up or down, you're throwing the dice about bleaching those molecules. And always bleaching and how many cycles you can go is a problem in these methods. But furthermore, once you're active, that it takes a lot of time to, and a lot of light to deactivate everything completely except at the nodes. And time and energy are your enemies when it comes to live cell imaging. So we thought of an alternative approach, which is instead of activating all of the molecules, let's use a standing wave of that purple light to activate only a subset of molecules in a sinusoidal activation pattern, and then read those out with another sine wave at the, at the excitation wavelength. And by doing that, we introduce one more harmonic. So instead of being limited to twice beyond the diffraction limit, we're limited to three times beyond the diffraction limit. But that takes us to 62 nanometer resolution, which is really darn good in this business. 
And so you've been able to see as it scrolls along going from, from diffraction limit to linear sim to nonlinear sim. And you can see that now with nonlinear sim, we have sub-second acquisition times, which is fast enough to be able to then do the 25 images we need, uh, raw images we need to get per image, um, but collect all those in half a second, and then we're able to follow without artifacts dynamics in living cells at 60 nanometer resolution. So how does this compare? Remember, the Nobel Committee said SIM shouldn't belong because it doesn't have the resolution of the other methods. Well, here's a comparison against actin with localization microscopy, similar to palm. And then here's an, but this is now on a fixed cell where they had as much time as they want to bleed out all the molecules. Here is a, a live image here where we took that image in a little over a second. And we've looked at this in real space, 4A space. We don't see any significant difference in resolution. Despite the claim of 20 nanometer resolution here, and a theoretical limit of the resolution of 60 nanometers here. But instead of getting one time point, we got 34 with 600 times faster and 20 times less light on the sample. Um, and so clearly you can see if people think that SIM doesn't belong in the same breadth as STED, Palm, and those techniques, this is here to tell you that's wrong is that SIM is absolutely competitive with those methods. And furthermore, is way ahead in terms of metrics of, of time and intensity for live imaging. So another example of the nonlinear SIM is on a different mechanism of bringing things into the cell. There are these little objects called caviole, which can also invaginate and bring in cargos. And so this is showing as we go again from the different modes from diffraction limited to the nonlinear sim, um, eventually we're able to resolve these much smaller pits than the classroom pits because of our 60 nanometer resolution that we have here. Now we compare this again to the EM. In EM, it's pretty well known that, that caviolin forms these caviolae of a very stereotypical 60 to 80 nanometer size. But we saw caviolin in all sorts of ring-like structures of various sizes. And it kind of points again to one of the strengths of using fluorescence in that in EM, you wouldn't know whether caviolin is here, here, or here because everything's just black and white. But with this, because you just light up the caviolin, you can identify it in other structures that you wouldn't be able to unambiguously figure out through EM alone. So we can do another comparison then. So we haven't yet compared, oops, let me go back to, um, to, uh, um, to STED type techniques. So Stefan recognizing the limitations of STED in terms of being way too high power for live imaging, developed a variant that would use photo switchable proteins to again activate in a diffraction limited spot, then use a depletion donut to deactivate everywhere except at the center in, this, in the same principle. Um, that's called resolved. So this is looking at caviolin in a paper they did last year by resolved. This is our diffraction limited result, the limited sim and the nonlinear sim. So we took 20 time points versus one, 200 times faster and 20 times less intensity. You can see we can resolve the rings here that you can't resolve here, despite comparable reported resolution. So that's another thing that's always been a bug, a bee in my bonnet about the super resolution field is I believe the metrics people use to judge their resolution are really inferior and really not telling you the true story across most of the field of view. It's sort of cherry picked generally. And so um, uh, I think that the, you know, probably even the real results that are reported usually by STED, resolved or even localization in many cases are easily obtainable by SIM. And SIM is so much faster and so much easier to do, you'd be an idiot to do anything else until you have to go beyond the resolution of SIM. And then, in my opinion, the only method that really is suitable below that level is localization. But it's very hard because of the densities that you require. Um, so we only have one good photo switchable protein to do the nonlinear SIM, but we can combine linear and nonlinear SIM to do multicolor imaging. So this is an example where we're looking at a protein which decorates endosomes. So after the classroom coated pit comes in, 
it forms a different type of body called an early endosome as it's moving the cargo deeper into the cell. And so you can see from these green spots that these endosomes are not little round balls anymore, but they have these very irregular shapes. And so now we have enough resolution at the diffraction limit, they still look like fuzzy blobs. But here's three examples we pull from the data. And I chose those three because I cherry picked them because they look similar to a 20 year old EM paper. So you can see that now finally we can now look at the shapes of endosomes and look at the dynamic changes in those shapes over time. Um, we can also see that there are cargos by these dark things inside of those endosomes. And finally, we've done a lot about correlating the motion of these endosomes to the actin cytoskeleton. And there are various corrals where they're, where they're trapped for a period of time. There's also fast cytoskeletal transport of endosomes for some subpopulation. So the moral of the story of SIM was is that, again, you know, th this is kind of a theme of, of my research, is that when people start going in one particular direction, I try to run as fast as I can in the opposite direction. And so many people working on super resolution had this myopic focus that spatial resolution was the only metric that mattered and we should focus on better and better spatial resolution. But if that were the case, we could have stopped with EM years ago, okay? Mott's understood that by ha giving up something in terms of spatial resolution, he gained a lot in terms of other metrics that opened an application space, of a field that he could play virtually alone in for a period of time. And so um, the other metrics, of course, for live imaging are how much damage you do to the cell, can you image fast enough to see the cell, which can move pretty damn fast, and can you image deep? And so if we learned a lot by backing a little bit off, it begs the question, what if we back off even further? Can we go to the diffraction limit and learn something? So when I was sick of Palm and super resolution in 2008, I made that my goal. And the idea was, can we look at cells in 3D and look at their dynamics by a, in, at high speed by as much of a gain in the temporal axis as Palm was in the spatial axis? So why do you want to do that? Well, if you think about the goal of biology is to understand the rules by which molecules self-assemble to create life. And just as if you wanted to understand, say, a, a football game, um, if all you have is a bunch of still pictures of, say, a quarterback throwing a pass or cheerleaders making a, a pyramid on the sideline, you'd be damn difficult to figure out how to correlate all of these things and understand the rules. But if you can just watch the game, just be there and see the whole thing continuously, the rules become obvious. And so you have to look at live cell dynamics. That the best structural tools are fine, but they're only a piece of the puzzle. And so that's what I really wanted to work towards. The good news is that the most common tools for doing live cell imaging, the wide field microscope and the confocal microscope, leave a lot of room for improvement. The problem with them is that they bathe the entire thickness of the sample with light, even though only one plane is in focus at a time. And so through these other parts, they're just doing a bunch of bleaching, a lot of damage. They're creating a lot of background. And so um, one of the most important innovations in microscopy in the past 15 years was when Ernst Stelzer at the EMBL in Heidelberg dusted off a 100-year-old idea called plane illumination. So in this case, instead of bringing in the excitation from the top and spearing through the whole sample, you'd use like a cylindrical lens to create a sheet of light which illuminates only in the region of the focal plane. And so because the areas above and below aren't illuminated at all, there's no bleaching and no toxicity there. In the, in the plane itself, you're illuminating it all at once, so you can use a fast camera, get that data really quick, and then go plane by plane up scanning that plane through the specimen, get a 3D image. So this has been really transformative for understanding embryogenesis at single cell resolution. But at subcellular level, it's got a problem in that there's a trade-off between how flat that sheet of light can be and how thick it is. And over the dimensions of a single cell, it needs to be about three microns thick, which is a reasonable fraction of the total thickness of the cell, so you don't gain much benefit. So we and others introduced the idea of using a Bessel beam, 
where you illuminate just the rear pupil of the objective with a ring, and then that creates a pencil of light where you can decouple the diameter of the pencil from its length. And then you can scan that pencil in and out of the screen here, collect an image, sweep up to the next plane in the cell, da 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 da, and get your image in 3D. So it sounds slow, but in modern embodiments, we go up to 1,000 planes a second. So there was one problem with this approach in that a Bessel beam isn't just a pencil of light, but in cross-section it looks like a bullseye with these concentric rings. And they create some out-of-focus excitation that you don't want. So our solution to that was to, instead of continually moving the beam, step it to create a grading of illumination. And then we could use Motz's methods of structured illumination microscopy to make lemonade from our lemons and use the information in the side lobes to actually extend the resolution beyond the diffraction limit, both axially and in the sweep direction. So this is an example of doing that, where we're looking at a cell which was transfected with a cancer signaling protein that promotes all this ruffling of the membrane. And these then fold over and encapsulate the extracellular fluid as these big vacuoles that you see underneath in this x-ray view here. But now we can then study, again, 3D dynamics at the speeds of biology for hundreds of time points. So in order to make this work as well as it did, though, we got lucky. Because in our original variant, we used a single beam. And when we went to 7, just for the speed reasons, what was shocking was how much less phototoxic it was to run with 7 beams instead of 1. And what I've learned in six years of doing live imaging is while the total dose of light that you supply to the specimen is important, a far more important metric is the instantaneous power that's delivered to the cell. So seen in this light, that confocal microscope, which is kind of the gold standard, is probably the stupidest possible way to do live imaging because not only do you have these cones of light above and below that are doing all this damaging and bleaching here. At the focus itself, you have an actinic spot of light that's going, and it's leaving death and destruction in its wake as it goes along. And so the moral of the story is that a line is better than a point, and a plane is better than a line. So why stop at seven beams? Well, if you go even closer between those beams, you have to figure out what happens when there's coherent interference of the side lobes. So I started to model that, and what I found is that as the beams get closer and closer together, you go through these resonances and anti-resonances of constructive and destructive interference. But it turns out there's magic periods down here of these patterns of Bessel beams where you get near-perfect destructive interference of the side lobes, which is ideal. That problem is gone. You have near 100% modulation in the plane, which is ideal for structured illumination microscopy. And you totally spread the light out across the entire plane to keep the peak power down, to keep the phototoxicity down. So it's a triple win. I am an engineer at heart. Triple wins are about as common as unicorns. And when you find one, you embrace it. And so this became what we call lattice light sheet microscopy. I was very happy about this, but I was also extremely pissed at myself at the same time because it turned out that these magic periods here are nothing more than periods that I had predicted 10 years previously when I developed that optical lattice theory. And so um, that I tossed in the trash when we went onto the palm, but I could have reached this conclusion a lot earlier if I had been smarter. But I was able to then pull that theory out of the wastebasket, figured out about these 2D optical lattices that would be ideal for this microscope, and then use those. And so here's some examples of what we can do with that microscope. So at left, you're looking at a field of dividing cells and looking at three things at once, the chromosomes by the histones, the mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, and then that endoplasmic reticulum again. So that net-like endoplasmic reticulum you saw before folds up into these little pockets when the cell divides. This is taking the data and slicing it computationally in two micron thick slabs so you can see what's happening inside. And so the ER forms these pockets. The mitochondria, which are sausages fragmented into pieces, they fit inside of those pockets and they're carried along as the cell divides. Now during cell division, Cells are very light sensitive, and they have all these checkpoints where they'll shut down if they're stressed. But here we were able to take 300 volumes in each of three different colors very quickly, and still all of the cells divided perfectly happily. 
despite the fact that we took almost half a million images of that field of cells to get that data. Um, there's other light-sensitive organisms like the slime mold amoeboid um, dictostelia that you can see here. Here you can see, you know, in a second, this little uh, lightning bolt will come back. And our collaborators look at that. We look at that and we go, what the fuck was that? You know, I mean, there's, there's just every week, there's just completely new surprises with this microscope. It sounds egotistical to say it, but, you know, I've never felt more like Galileo or, or Van Leeuwenhoek with, than with this microscope because we've had 50 different groups come for at least a week or two at a time to use this. And every group comes up with things that they've never identified before because of the level of spatiotemporal resolution that they've got here. So, you know, Palm is great and it's a very useful tool. But I'm morally convinced, based on the reception of my collaborators, that this is the tool that will probably uncover the most biology of any that I make in my career. If you like these movies, there's a whole album we have online. If you just Google Lattice Light Sheet Vimeo, where you'll see like 40 different examples of this kind of stuff here. So next level up is cell-cell interactions. So here we're looking at that T cell that we saw in sim before where we saw just the bottom of it, but now we can look at it in 3D, not at a high resolution, but certainly at much higher speed and with, with the 3D aspect. And so this is the T cell now interacting with a true antigen presenting cell instead of a cover slip. And what we identified is that there's a really fast flow of actin away from that immunological synapse after it's established. What you're seeing here is a neutrophilic type cell which is migrating through a collagen mesh. Now, much, obviously, people want to understand how cells migrate for a number of reasons. One is it's key to development, but another, it's key in cancer and how cancers, you know, colonize and metastasize other areas. But much of what we know about cell motility is by following them on cover slips, which is a pretty poor analog. So you really need to do 3D imaging like this to get a better idea of what's going on. And at the largest level, we can look at embryos during development. Let's get my C. elegans back. Um, so um, uh, in early C. elegans, you can look through the entire embryo. So here we're looking at a protein which leaves a little uh, garbage point right there at the mid-body called AAR2. And so that's th been thought to be just a little garbage piece left over, but our collaborator believes it actually has a functional role later in development that we're studying. Here you're looking at a fruit fly embryo, and they're about 500 microns big. We can't look through the whole bulk of that because it's too scattering. But near the surface, we can look down. And halfway through embryogenesis, there's these earlier cells called the amniocerosa, and then these epithelial cells grow and cover that up, as you can see this happening here in this what's called the purse string structure. And so these amniocerosa undergo these sort of positive feedback oscillations of expansion and contraction. And now with, the, with our tool, we can look at those on both the apical and basal surfaces of these cells and show that these are anti-correlated, these motions. And so um, the other thing it turns out that the lattice is good for is going all the way back full circle to single molecule techniques. So one of the skeletons in the closet of single molecule methods is that you're usually limited to cells that are only a few microns thick because the molecules that are out of focus create so much background, you can't see the ones that are in focus. But the lattice light sheet is actually thinner than the depth of focus of the detection optics. And so when you park that lattice in one plane, you're basically only able to illuminate molecules that are in focus. So here's a 35 micron spheroid of mouse embryonic stem cells where we're looking at transcription factor binding to DNA. And if you look at it with wide field, it's hopeless. But if you look at it with the lattice light sheet, it becomes very easy to get high SNR imaging of single molecules. And we've had a couple papers come out about understanding the kinetics of binding of transcription factors to DNA with this. So we've also, again, finally, this led us back to doing localization microscopy. So remember I said one of the big challenges is just to get enough damn label in there to get enough resolution. And with normal methods, you put the label in before you image, and that's it. And what you've got is what you've got. But in the same year that we, we published the Palm paper, another group um, at UPenn published a related idea, which doesn't use photoactivation, but instead your whole media around your cell 
is labeled with fluorescent molecules. And normally these are whizzing around so fast that they just create a blur. But when they stick to their targets, then, then they create a little star of light and you can localize that. That's called paint. The advantage of paint is that because the molecules keep on coming as you image, you have an infinite army and can go to higher and higher and higher density of localization. The disadvantage of paint is your media is glowing, so you run into that problem of background again. So lattice, light sheet, and paint is a marriage made in heaven. And so here's a couple examples where now we can do very high density localization over very large volumes in 3D, which you could really never do before with localization. In this case, we're looking at a 20 micron tall dividing cell. You can see all of the structure of those pockets of the ER that we saw at lower resolution before in this case. And so actually that paint, because it labels membranes, provides an interesting alternative to electron microscopy to get global contrast that then we can combine with the palm to do protein-specific contrast and correlate those two modalities. So the final problem is, is where my group is headed in the future, is that um, what I want to be able to do is see the cell on its own terms. I still feel like in cell biology we've never really done that because normally fluorescent proteins have been a fantastic tool, but their expression has been fairly uncontrolled. And so in the last few years there's been a revolution through these development of this genome editing techniques, such as CRISPR-Cas9, where now you can finally get the cell to express endogenous levels of a protein with a fluorescent tag. Now that's wonderful, but it typically means that these levels are lower than biologists have been used to using, and so the standard tools are way too invasive. But it's perfect for lattice light sheet. Uh, another marriage made in heaven is lattice light sheet and genome edited cells. And so now we have non-invasive imaging tools, so we're not cooking the cell, like a confocal would when we try to see it. We have endogenous expression levels. The missing piece of the puzzle is that we're still studying cells largely on cover slips, and they didn't evolve there. You need to study cells in the organism in which they evolved, where there's all the cell-cell signaling and everything else happening. The major challenge there is that biological material has to be heterogeneous for it to work, and so nuclei have different refractive indices from cytosol, from lipids, from other proteins, et cetera. And so it ends up scrambling your light sheet as it goes in. It ends up scrambling the light that comes out in the same way that water on your windshield will end up scrambling your image of the cars in front of you. And so astronomers had to deal with that problem 50 years ago because the atmosphere also scrambles light that comes to telescopes. And so their solution was adaptive optics where you bounce your distorted light off a deformable mirror, you put a little bit of it into a sensor that measures the distortion, you then close a loop and change the shape of that mirror to exactly cancel out that distortion, get a good wave front, and recover diffraction-limited imaging. So a number of groups, including ours, have been working now for a while on applying these and extending these techniques into biological samples. Um, so what they need to do in astronomy, because the stars or the galaxies themselves are too dim for that wavefront sensor, is they shine a laser up into the stratosphere to excite just a f uh, sodium atoms up there. And that creates a virtual guide star, it's called, of light, which is bright enough for the sensor. A couple years ago, a group in Barcelona did an experiment where they used a two-photon microscope to just locally excite fluorescence in a spot and use that for, for, uh, as their guide star. And so we adapted that, added a few wrinkles of our own, and it turns out for transparent specimens, this is very effective. So this is looking at a zebrafish embryo here, now in the spinal cord region about 200 microns deep. And you can see without the adaptive optics, the signal is low and the resolution is low. But you flip on the adaptive optics in the same two-photon microscope, and the signal goes way up, and you can see you recover the diffraction-limited imaging you would have if it were on a cover slip. Um, so one of the challenges in adaptive optics and microscopy is that um, if you want to cover a wide field of view, as you move from place to place, you're going through different materials, so different aberrations apply. So you need to make many, many corrections. 
So here we're looking at a reasonable fraction of the size of the zebrafish brain at a sparse set of neurons. But to cover a field that big, we had to segment it into 20,000 different subregions, each with a different correction. And now we're down again deep into the midbrain region. And we're going to turn off the adaptive optics. So that's what you would see with the tools biologists have today, a two-photon or confocal microscope. And this is now turning the AO back on. We're not doing super resolution here. We're just getting back to the diffraction limit. But most biologists have no idea exactly how shitty their imaging is when they go inside of uh, whole organisms. And so this is partly educational, but also hopefully a taste of what will come. So um, that's fine, but that guide star principle requires you to be able to actually see that guide star, which means the specimen, like the atmosphere, has to be basically transparent. But the most common model organisms under study at my institution are the fly brain and the mouse brain, and those things are far from transparent. The first time I saw a acute slice of, of mouse t of brain tissue under a microscope, I said, oh, well, that looks like tofu. And so trying to see neurons in tofu is like trying to see a star when the star is hidden behind a cloud. Well, astronomers haven't figured that one out yet, so we haven't been able to steal from them. So we came up with a, a number of tools using what's known as indirect wavefront sensing, where you don't have a sensor. I won't get into that now. But we just had a paper come out yesterday on finding out that we could actually use that direct wavefront sensor approach that I said couldn't be used in scattering material. And so the trick is, is from my colleague Najee, what she said is, well, the reason you use a two-photon microscope is because it uses infrared light that penetrates deeper. So why not use an infrared fluorescent protein or an infrared dye inside of your mouse brain to be able to create your guide star? Well, that works really well, as it turns out. And you can then get a good image on your wavefront sensor, find out the aberration, and now go pretty much through the entire mouse cortex and still recover diffraction-limited imaging, do functional imaging of neural activity. And so we think this is going to be a really good tool. Na is actually a neuroscientist and is already using this tool to be able to understand the inputs from the thalamus into the visual cortex and where directional selectivity arises. And she has a paper under submission about that. So with that, um, I'd like to, to wind up. So um, one of my biggest concerns as a tool developer and as a physicist is um, this gulf. There's this huge gulf between an experimental prototype a physicist can get to work and a tool a biologist can actually use. And there's this big valley of death in between. And so how do you get around that and make sure that, because you know, Nobel Prize doesn't matter, the papers don't matter, if these things don't actually answer any biological questions. So we were taking a three-prong approach to that. The first is that certainly for the lattice light sheet, and we hope soon for the sim, is we've created a complete kit of documentation. Everything from, you know, down to the screw level about what you need to buy, where, what it costs, mechanical drawings, uh, wiring diagrams, all the source code for the control and the uh, deconvolutions and everything else. And so if you sign a research license, we give that to you, and then you can build your own lattice scope. About 50 groups have executed those licenses so far. There's about eight such machines I know that are running at this point. Um, if, if you come from a biology group that doesn't have the, the skill set to put that together, the other thing we, we've tried to do is, or if you just want to find out if you want to go to that level of hassle, um, we partnered with the Moore Foundation to create an imaging center inside of Genelia that is only for outside people. And so it has many of the advanced microscopes we've developed at Genelia. It has the lattice light sheet, it has the SIM, it has Harold's eye palm, and it has this multifocal microscope that Mott's developed for simultaneous imaging of multiplanes in a sample, which is great for 3D single molecule tracking. And so it's just a two-page proposal. We don't believe in a lot of paperwork at Genelia. You fill that out. If you're accepted, you come for a week or two and use these scopes uh, and find out exactly if they can help answer questions for you. This has been wildly successful so far. And all of these scopes are running flat out week after week at this point. Um, 
The final part of the problem, though, was, has to be commercialization because having worked in industry myself, I have a great appreciation for the D and R and D and how that's 90% of the pyramid. And it requires, you know, the, the type of resources that you would have in a company to do that. And so um, the Lattice Light Sheet has been licensed to Zeiss, but they're a couple years away from a product. And so in the interim, um, we sub-licensed to a company called 3i in the States, and they offer clones of the Lattice Light Sheet product. And this is probably going to be a model we're going to use for the nonlinear SIM and for the AO and other microscopes as they come along. So with that, I'd, I'd like to thank many, many people. We have more collaborators than I can possibly mention, many people inside of Genelia. This is my group now. It's five people. It has averaged three. So almost everything you've seen here has been done pretty much in the last seven years by at most four people at a time, um, or generally four people at a time. So um, I really firmly believe in regardless of what you guys decide you want to do with your careers eventually, I've got some words of advice. First, do the thing that, that you feel passionate about, okay? Find something that you really, really feel very strongly about because if you feel strongly about it, you'll try to fight through the limitations and the difficulties. There may be ultimately find, you know, insurmountable reasons as I've found in a number of times in my life, but still you'll learn from those experiences and you'll find something else to latch on to. But the, but the passion is necessary too to do the hard work necessary to get stuff done. I mean, I've known a lot of brilliant people in my life, but I would, I would exchange them all for one really hard working guy. I mean, I think particularly in experimental science, there, and it's true in any walk of life, whether you're going to be a cook or a rap artist or what have you, there is no substitute for working your ass off. And you just can't learn your field without doing that and excel in your field without doing that. And I've been fortunate enough and I put a high bar when I hire my postdocs and I say, the first question when they say, can I join your group, I say, how hard do you like to work? And have you ever always wanted to join the army? You know, so uh, um, I, I really value that. And the reason we've been successful is because we have a model where we can focus 100% of our attention on a problem and really work hard at it. So I think that's just, I think that's a general principle that you guys should think about if you have an ambition to excel in anything that you may want to do in the future. Thanks for your time.